we run at 35,000 RPM, um, which does present some um, things you'd want to look at. There's two technologies on the high speed. There's the um, magnetic, and then there's the air bearing. And over the years, I think air bearings at time, because they were uh, initially came out about 10 years ago, um, everybody put them in all kinds of applications. And it, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, it's another, I guess, another arrow for your quiver to look at uh, as, for, as far as high speed. So there are some limitations uh, with any technology that you, you look at. And with the high speed air bearing, there is some limitation. Uh, I, I cover primarily the, uh, some states east of the Mississippi, and, but I also go all the way out to Nevada. And in the east, we see a lot of blower rooms below grade. And with varying um, water tables, uh, these areas can get um, damp, um, moldy, the H2S is a prevalent, and a lot of those kinds of things that, it, that can happen. And so the air bearing initially didn't have any filtering on the air bearing. So as the, it all, which I'll get into, as you start an air bearing up, it's, there's two ways to, to cool an, an air, air bearing. And I'll get into that, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a history on um, air bearings. You know, they're 60 years old. They were first developed uh, by Boeing and looking at um, high turbines. The other area that, that you probably are not aware of, but you're using a air bearing almost every day is on your laptop. That's essentially the high, the uh, hard drive when it's spin is spinning like a uh, air bearing. So how does an air bearing work? Um, you know, at that 35,000 RPM, um, there's a shell or a lining that uh, it's not contacting surface. And as the uh, shaft starts rotating, it drags air into a convergent region, which I'll uh, have a little bit better uh, pictures on that coming up. But as this rotation starts and the pressure increases, it starts pulling this air into that and starts um, rising, the shaft starts rising, riving off of um, this lining or shell. And that's sometimes why it's called a bump bearing because at the very first, it's, it starts bumping. And it's been, like I say, it's been around for a long time. And that's another issue with air bearings. It's how fast do those, do, does an air bearing start? Because if it's slow um, starting, you can have a lot of issues with wear on that. So that's where you, you want to look at anytime looking at an air bearing is how fast does that uh, shaft come off of that um, shell or lining. And that's an extremely important part of, of increasing the life of, of a high speed air bearing um, turbine. And if, and if it's slow, that's, that's going to reduce the life of that, um, of that unit. So as that starts rising and as the pressure starts generating and as it starts getting up to full speed, um, that air or a lot of times it, the will be called fluid or, or air helps lubricate and keep the um, cooling of the air bearing and keep it to where it doesn't need any lubrication and helps um, keep it uh, suspended so you're not um, causing any issues with uh, with wear. This is kind of basic what a inside of an air bearing looks like. You know, they're highly efficient. There's no drive coupling. There's essentially one moving part and that's just the shaft. Uh, as you look at this one, like I mentioned, if the air bearing is sitting on that shell, as you start rotating and, and you can see the cooling air inlet, it pulls the cooling air in and it cools the shaft. Now 35,000 RPM as uh, you know, Temperature can kill, and at 35,000 RPM, you do generate a, a lot of temperature. So that's where this air movement is, is extremely important through this whole uh, air bearing um, assembly. So as you move through and you're constantly pulling care, 
cool air in and moving the hot air out and exhausting the hot air. Now, something that you, not everyone does this, but it's, a, it's what you should also kind of look at is the filtering on both the cooling in and the, the discharge area. Um, a lot of people don't put filters on there, but I think that uh, there are some manufacturers that are beginning to put a simple filter on there to help keep this clean because the um, tolerances are very tight. And if you pull anything out, I think it's called, I saw one situation where um, we opened up, and sometimes people refer to this as the core. And I think it's called silk wood and it looks, and if you, um, I don't know if you have it in the West Coast, but we have it in the, the Midwest. It looks like it's snowing and it's this big feathery type stuff. I've seen that, that kind of thing being pulled into um, these air bearings and they foul the air bearing. So that's where filtering becomes extremely important to increase the, the life of this. Um, so the location that an air bearing blower goes on in, like I mentioned earlier, is extremely important been to a lot of wastewater plants and I've seen some blower rooms that are very nice. They're clean, they're fairly quiet. I wouldn't even have a problem eating my lunch in there. And then there's others that um, sometimes I think I need to wear a hazmat suit in order to, to go in there. That's probably not a good location for um, a high speed air bearing. The other th where I see a lot of times is cooling the room itself, the ambient temperature that the high-speed blower is sitting in is another consideration because of, as you can see in this, this design where you're pulling that cooling air into the air bearing and it's automatically heating up fairly quickly. If the ambient temperature outside and there's no cooling to the air bearing or the whole core system, which I, I've got it something later on I'll show you, that that's also an important consideration. So not every application uh, that you look at um, is going to be beneficial or an air barrier is going to be beneficial. And that's where you need to look at the different technologies. And so there are specific things to look at for any kind of, um, of application you're looking for. Also, what happens is that since the shaft is laying on that uh, shell, it's a pretty common standard now that they're, they're Teflon coating that to help reduce that wear and reduce and, and increase the life expectancy of air bearings. Because um, probably from a economic standpoint, your mag bearing is your most expensive. Your air bearing is next, multi-stage is next, and then PD is, is the, the least expensive for the same kind of pressure and flow. Each of them have their advantages, each of them have their disadvantages. So I guess what I was stressing here is that if you need, or if you're looking at a high speed, ask some of those questions. You know, where's it gonna be located? What real estate you're putting it in? How clean is the environment? Um, and what kind of filtering for the air bearing? This is another representation of maybe what I've been talking about. And if you look at the different parts, there's the casing. Uh, that would be the same equivalent as that I'll refer to some as just a ball or roller bearing. They have a casing and it's the same kind of situation for an air bearing. The next is the um, that foil or um, where the the bump bearing goes on. And as you can see from the light blue is, is the shaft is, and this is a um, at rest. And you see there is um, contact between the two. And that's where you want that quick startup. And if you can, uh, from an application standpoint, we, we're beginning to see a lot of hybrid systems. And what I mean by that is we're seeing the, uh, air bearing or the high speed as the main blower that you run 24 seven. That way you, you get away from ever needing to um, the starting or stopping because high speed blowers don't like that starting and stopping. They wanna run, they wanna keep things suspended all the time. So that's where it's extremely important um, to, to look at some of these kinds of, uh, of issues. 
Then there's the, the bump foil. And it, this is, um, I had that spring loaded, whereas the, um, the shaft comes off of, of the foil and it's, it literally bounces back and forth for a while, but it, it's not making contact because as you, the uh, shaft starts pressurizing and you start pulling that air into the shaft um, system, there's still cushioning, but you're still getting some of that bouncing effect from the, from the foil. Um, journal or shaft, it's, uh, you know, the, the main driving force of, of the, um, the high speed. And lastly is the gas or air. Usually most people are using air at this point. The other thing you should be aware of is that, you know, Hoffman Lamson, we, we introduce it from ambient air. We, do, we have the, uh, the seals on that. Others are doing the same thing. But uh, there are others, air bearings out there, that they're actually pulling inert gas, uh, introducing inert gas to, to, the, uh, to the system or some other kind of outside source. Um, it's just another component that goes with the air bearing uh, configuration. Um, don't know if necessarily good or bad. And also the other part of it um, on the air bearing where we're using air cooling, you also at times see liquid cooling, which is another outside, um, another component that could be add complexity to, to the overall system. If you will, when the air bearing is not energized, uh, the main surfaces, and if you will, the the blue is is the foil, and there's really not showing a whole lot of mating, but but the lighter blue is is what you're considering is is the shaft. As you start rotating, and the pressure starts coming in, and you start sucking in the fluid or air into the system, that's where this. Um, gas becomes pressurized and it starts lifting that shaft off that. If you kind of look at say a ball bearing or roller bearing, it's very similar, but instead of using oil, they're using grease or, or excuse me, instead of using air as your lubricant, they're using uh, a grease or a um, oil of some sort to, to have that film or that lubrication or the suspension of the ball or roller bearings. So they're not, touching the metal surface. You know, the gap is small as it preloads and as it begins to, uh, the air, as you pull the air in from the, the previous draw and, and you, it escapes the atmosphere, more is pulled in and as you increase the speed, that will continue to increase that pressure and help stabilize the shaft and give you the cushion you need and the lubrication you need to uh, reduce the um, any kind of, of contact, any kind of friction, which would reduce the wear. You know, when, it's, when the pressure comes large enough, the, everything starts um, moving off. And as you get, come up to speed, there's a static equilibrium that's, that's reached and it stabilizes the, uh, the whole system. And um, I'll get into it here in a, uh, in a second where um, it re helps reduce things like um, sound and it will also accuracy and those kinds of things. So as this system becomes more pressurized, um, it, be it pulls in more air and you get a, a, a better lubrication. The air gap distance um, continues to, to, to change. So the total load as it increases, you know, the pressure within um, the system separates and the larger pressure results in larger um, separation. So as you're speeding up, and this becomes important, I'd like to, I don't know if you, I would su suspect a lot of you are uh, have basins at your plant and one of the, Issues with basin control is you have multiple blowers going into a common header and you have uh, multiple basins and 
uh, the air is coming out of a uh, a common header. So, and then also what happens is during the course of of the year, as the temperature changes, you can change the speed of the blower to compensate for the density of air. So when it's colder outside and you don't need as much flow, that's the other um, area where high speed blowers come into effect where they're using a VFD and a PLC to control that speed. And they control the speed and the basic fan laws will tell you if you can reduce your um, speed by 5%, you reduce the most horsepower requirement by 15. So there's a lot of cost savings um, by using a VFD and having that algorithm to compensate for those changes in air temperature. Um, I just recently traveled and well, Sunday, I, I live in Ohio and on Sunday I got up um, to fix my wife breakfast and it was snowing, it, which is completely out of the ordinary. This Saturday, I'm gonna be playing golf and it's gonna be uh, about 80 degrees. So that's where that speed changes over the course of a few days. And if you don't have that um, reduction of speed, um, you can get into a lot of issues with the performance of a high speed or a multi-stage or any, any centrifugal blower. So looking at those kinds, kinds of issues and speed and the separation and all those kinds of things and how the, the amount of air that comes out into your system so that's where this um, speed differentiation and the, um, the pressure differentiation um, becomes important as you slow down or speed up. And you, but you're always going to have that um, separation. You're always going to have that air to help lubricate it. So, you know, so at this point, due to the lack of contact between the mating surfaces, frictionless. I see a lot of people say zero wear. I'm not all that convinced that it's zero wear. I think it's pretty near wear because if you can rise that um, shaft off of that foil in a fairly quick manner, and we're talking less than a second, um, there's not a lot of wear. But there is going to be some contact wear, even though it's Teflon coated, and even though it's coming off fairly quickly, and it's got a one or two bounces and it's being cushioned by the air as it's pressurized, it's, it's still, I don't think, completely near zero wear. Um, this is kind of the difference between um, the a roller bearing and a air bearing. You know, roller bearing, mechanical bearing, there's imperfections and there's a, a groove that, are, that it rides in. So noise is created because of those imperfections in the motions of the ball or roller bearing. And that's where you get start getting those noises on, on the bearings. Um, and with regular bearings, um, ball or, or um, roller bearings, you know, a lot of times you, you can put oil in it or you put grease in it. And by putting, having the soap in the grease also, causes some more friction building up, a little higher running, um, and especially after you've, um, if you're greasing over a period of time, the soap in the, in the grease doesn't always dissipate. So there's extra soap or that um, carrying product that goes through with delivering oil. Well, high speed air bearings don't have that. You don't have to worry about that because the, there is no lubricant, there is no oil, and the oil or the lubricant is all, all the air surface and that pressure rising the, um, um, the shaft. Repeatability. The lack of wear is extremely important, which I've talked about. You know, an accuracy is maintained the entire life uh, of that because it's very stable on how it operates. Uh, 60 years of developing the air bearing has exhibited a lot of these uh, high stability, high repeat, repeatability. Um, you know, it's the same thing as if Boeing is willing to use high speed in airplanes, and I um, don't always mean this to be funny, but, um, you know, the, we wouldn't probably be too happy if landing airplanes, we had a 98% success rate. So 
to give you the idea of the repeatability and the stability and the uh, accuracy of that, uh, if, if a company like Boeing is willing to use that on an airplane, um, I would think you know that that speaks volumes to um, the repeatability and stability of, of air bearings. <clears throat> High speed operations. Um, you know there there are, there is some limitation. I'm, I mentioned already heat. You know there's some some wearing of mating surfaces, and that's a lot of times where why on high speed um, we we move away from a ball bearing or um, roller bearing. Not that they're not used in high speed applications, but uh, in this particular case in the blower industry, it's not really the uh, the answer. So that's where um, we look at air bearings because no matter what you do um, for the roller or ball bearing, you know, they're slipping and they're, there's dragging, you know, they're, they're in a cage a lot of times. So that's a wear point or could potentially be a wear point. So you got to separate the balls and the or the rollers um, to help decrease this, the load issues that you may have. And, um, and over time, those issues can, um, can, can worsen. Um, you don't have quite the, um, that, those same issues, the negative aspects uh, with air. You are gonna generate heat, and back to the first, um, uh, one of the first slides where I showed the heat being pulled in. Uh, so you are gonna have the, that heat and the cooling's um, there, but, but you're, even though there's heating in that air bearing, just the pure pack that you're always adding fresh air to the system helps keep that heat uh, function down and helps keep it cool, even though um, the gas has, has a tendency to, to rise. Okay. Um, there's, there's two kinds of um, actions going on. And the first is the aerodynamic. And I, I don't have, keep repeating myself, but you know, at rest, there's two main mating surfaces in direct contact. Um, you know, but I want you to get an idea of this aerodynamic is being part of. And as, and as the relative motion, the air molecules from atmosphere come in and they accumulate, they create this gap that uh, helps suspend that. And as the speed and velocity, um, the pressure gradient uh, rises and helps um, the clearances of the um, air bearing and the shaft. And as that, like mentioned, as the pressure continues to increase, it creates um, a load carrying effect. And that, um, because of that pressure gradient, and it can get up as, much as, um, you know, 100, let's see, what is it, 30 bar and it's 14.7 times 30. So um, it can get to be a pretty high pressure to help that load carrying um, ability. Now, a lot of times what will happen on these load carrying abilities is that, especially with air bearings, depending on the motor size, uh, which is based on the amount of flow, you may only have one air bearing to maintain that, and that's usually 150 horsepower or below. But as you start getting over 150, the pressure increases, the flows increase, you could see a, an additional air bearing, so you have a dual unit to help carry this load. So that's another thing you'll, you'll see in the industry is uh, both single and dual load carrying bearings. Um, you know, the, the speed is, is critical. The 35,000 RPM is a very critical to that. Um, you know, that, so therefore, you know, at zero speed, there's no load. And I've, I've kind of mentioned that, um, you know, the starting and stopping funk, uh, friction um, and these hybrid systems, what, what we're beginning to see a lot of is to get away from that starting and stopping and using them as your primary um, air producing um, technology.
The other part is the aerostatic uh, air bearing principle. This is where, you know, allows the external pressure to supply to the bearing. Um, it helps that negative effect on surface wear for starting and stopping. So that's why they're using the aerostatic um, part of, of, the, um, of that. So if you're, you're gonna hear these two terms, or you may wanna look at these two terms as do they cover both? And um, if they cover both, they're gonna give you the, the longest life and the best operation. So they're, you know, by being aerostatic, that's that air pulling in, the one second lifting off of the shaft, the bump bearing that it, that's being put, even though it's it's not stable yet as it starts up, it usually will take, you know, um, five or six seconds, but even at that point, it can cause some issues. And if it's longer than that, it's probably not this aerostatic where it's that bump bearing effect, but it's being cushioned by the air that's coming in and helping stabilize it quickly. So as the pressure increases, the air increases, and there the uh, stability increases, and you have a much um, uh, stable air bearing. This is kind of the parts, um, a better view of the um, of the air bearings. Um, what you know, this is kind of our our product, but I think a lot of uh, uh, folks out there are doing the same thing. We're using Inconel because it's a, it's a much better um, product for this, this kind. It, from the wear, the uh, stability of it, um, the heat, all those types of things. And this is what the foil looks like. And that's um, back to the picture where it showed the groove. And this is where that uh, kind of that, the bumping um, term comes from. And the, the Teflon coated um, sleeve that goes around the, um, uh, the shaft so that you're coating that to help reduce that, um, any kind of effect of the um, of wear that as you start it up. And so the latest technology on the multi fold bearing is, you know, I would, wouldn't quite say maintenance free, uh, I guess. It does say it here, but um, you know you do want to go out and you want to look at it um, ever so often, and you do. And having access to that unit is important, and I'll get I'll show you here in a second. But what we're really trying to do is uh, reduce life cycle costs because one of the the issues that between a multi stage and a high speed is that anybody can work on a high speed. So if you need to change bearings or change uh, seals, those kinds of things, it's pretty easily done. On a high speed, it gets a little bit uh, more costly. Uh, you really need a certified um, technician to come out and look at it and to work on it. So you do a little, lose a little bit of the ability to do that maintenance um, on that. So, but looking at the, the bearings, listening for them, because I, I think if you, get accustomed to what the sound looks like and what it sounds like is, a, I think, an important aspect of, of the system. Is So if you go out there one day and it's you hear something and, and it's always been that way and you go out the next day and you may hear some kind of squeaking or some kind of noise, um, you know, that may be something you, you would want to start taking a look at. You know, filtering of the, the bearing, cooling of it, which I've got some slides I'll show you in a, in a minute, to, to look at that. So to understand how your system works. And also on startup, let's, if, you, if you happen to um, turn it off or you're going to be starting up one, get accustomed to all the sounds of, of your system. And that will really help you understand the maintenance, understand the, uh, the life cycle cost. You know, there's, and, you know, like I say, because of, of centrifugal blowers and the nature of centrifugal blowers. And as the temperature changes, the curves change, the rise of surge change. So you need that wide range of stability on, on uh, speeds from a maximum speed around 36,000 to something less than that um, to really 
address the issues that you're going to see from a, um, a day to day, because you have different events, you have major rain events, perhaps that come in and all of a sudden um, you have issues there. I did a project in uh, Brookings, South Dakota, and I, th I thought it was an interesting project because Brookings, South Dakota is a town of about 15,000 people when they designed their wastewater plant. It was also the, the town where the, either the University of South Dakota or South Dakota State is located. And there's about 20,000 students that show up in August. And it, they're also a big uh, football school. So on home Saturdays, you've got the 20,000 students all, show, all of a sudden showed up. Now you got a, another 30 or 40,000 people that show up to go to the game. And then there's another, you know, who, who knows how many that just show up for the party in at the game. So now you, you can imagine what that kind of does for those weekends that there's a football weekend. And then to top that off, um, a chicken plant moved in. So now there's a, a, a major change to what they were looking at uh, as far as needing to, to compensate for that DO control that they're going to have in their basin. So that's where extending or, or looking at the, um, the speeds and be able to have that flexibility for those kinds of events that, you, that might happen throughout the year. And it is 100% oil free. You don't need any oil um, for any of this. Get into a little bit more of the air gas operating principle just to review it. Um, you know, thin layer pressurized fluid gas that redu reduces the frictions between the rotating surfaces. You know, it helps improves um, this backlash, um, which is that bouncing of the um, um, the shaft. So if you didn't have, or if it doesn't come up to speed quick enough, you could have no cushion of air. And then that's where you really start that on the, it doesn't become stable. So there's, um, can be a, a, what's called a backlash um, issue. You know, it's excellent for um, the high speed applications. Um, you may hear the term wedge, which is sometimes used as that um, buffer system as far as the, um, what the, the shaft is riding on. So it creates a wedge between um, the, um, the foil and the shaft. We say operating at 35,000 RPMs, um, air bearings have um, really captured that high speed. I mentioned the, about a roller bearing and, and the issues that you may have there. This is where that stability comes in at about 2,000 RPM. So as you start it up, turn on the blower and you're ramping it up, you want it you know, one to two seconds is 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 okay, um, but I prefer and I would would want to see it somewhere in that one second range. So it because and and gets stable at about two thousand. So as it bumping back and forth, the stability, the pressure increases uh, rapidly and creates that stability. The minimal contact between uh, surfaces is all that important. And that's why um, Teflon coating was introduced is to, to reduce that uh, contact between the, the surfaces to help ex, uh, extend the life because a comparable multi-stage or PD is probably half the cost um, of what a high-speed can. So there's, that's why that, uh, things like that were, were introduced. Another thing I would look at if I was interested in a high speed is that starts and stops. How many starts and stops can it do? Because we do start and stop them. Uh, we need to take them down for 
whatever reason. So, you know, you want high capable starts and stops and probably somewhere in that, that 100,000 hour operation range um, before anything needs to be done. And that's where the cooling and the filtering and all those kinds of things come in because eventually at 35,000 RPM, if you don't have the cooling that you need, you're going to run into situations where, uh, you know, heat kills after a while and heat always wins out. So trying to keep the operation as cool as possible, moving air through that system and keeping it protected is important. I mentioned main three and the two design parts, uh, just to mention them again, aerostatic and aerodynamic. All right, let me move this. You know, the air is um, produced for internally to keep, that's what your process is going to, um, to operate on. Um, you, like I say, you don't want any kind of external uh, pressurization. There's still some people out there that are doing that. Um, I, I think you want the natural um, pulling in of the outside air, the ambient air pulled in, it keeps it cool, and it's one less uh, product to have to worry, worry about. And I, I think I've mentioned both of this stuff, just that the, you know, the stabilization starts about 2000 and, and about 10,000, you should probably see uh, at least stabilizations. Uh, excuse me. Overall picture of what a air bearing looks like with all the uh, the parts to it. It's a pretty simple design. Um, you know, here's the main rotor, which I've been referring to as a shaft. It has a casing, um, you know, the, the motor uh, induction or, P, or um, motor. And these are all the parts, it's the, it's the single impeller. Um, you want, when you're looking at impellers, that's another uh, aspect of high-speed bearings um, is that you want a um, very well-machined impeller. Um, that's, you know, because it needs to be balanced. And if it's not extremely balanced, it's gonna throw that whole thing, the whole system off and all the things that are done uh, on the air bearing side ends up being um, kind of negated without a, a really, well-balanced, um, high-quality impeller. The other thing I kind of looked at, I told you is, this is um, an example of an easily accessible um, air bearing. And, and to be able to, and the other thing is that even though it's accessible, this is usually a pressurized um, cabinet. So you can't just go and open it up as it's running. It's gotta be turned off to, to, to look at it, but, um, but it is accessible to, to look at that. You know, this is a very compact design, you know, good accessibility for, um, not necessarily for maintenance on a daily basis, but, you know, call in a tech to, to, to see for maintenance. It's easy to, for them to get to. Um, and in our case, we mount this uh, on an independent frame to help reduce the vibration and, and noise. You know, the a soundproof enclosure is, is good you, uh, to help reduce that. Um, we're usually at Hoff Lance, we're in that 61 to 74 um, sound range. I think uh, a lot of others are also, but uh, they can be uh, pretty quiet. So um, something also to consider. And just um, the uh, the base, the air intake, the, you get the directional rotation and the, the process air outlet. This is, is 
the overall cabinets, what I've, I've talked about, actually I put two on here is that, because I think they're both integral to um, high speeds. And what you really want to look at is two separate um, filtering system. The one on the left is a separate filtering sy system just for the electronics. And um, it's, you know, like say it's VFD. So also what you, and VFDs run hot. So that's where uh, cooling is important. And in this particular case, we're pulling it from the outside and there is an exhaust um, uh, vent and fan assembly to help, help keep it cool. So, and, and this is an area also where on the electronic side where it's important what real estate you're looking at to put one because the same thing I've seen a lot of times where the, where the core is fine, but it's the instrumentation side that can be a problem. And same thing, I've seen a lot of corroded um, parts on the, on the control side. So um, filtering and cooling is important. And then so on the, on the air side is just showing that in this particular case, um, you got a cooling fan and you're pulling up from the bottom and it's cooling and moving that air. It's not necessarily, it's gonna be hot air that comes out, but you're pulling in cooling air and that just that motion of always replacing it and extracting so the hot air isn't settling um, inside the cabinet. As you start getting into the larger machines, and this is where I mentioned about having the two cores, and this is where you get a lot larger machines. And like I said, the previous was a single, these are, are twins. And in, in this particular case, as you get into these, into the larger uh, units, the two, 250, 300, um, you really wanna look at two cooling type systems for the air bearings because you got twice the potential um, temperature. The red is, um, indicative of air and the blue is um, some kind of cooling. Usually it can be water, it can be glycol, or, um, it can be a number of things, but once again, it's usually a closed loop system to help um, cooling of the, um, of the high speed. So as you go up into those bigger machines, look for um, two cooling systems um, on that to help out. And we still see some out there that have a cooling tower where you're pulling the cooling from outside that can get, that can uh, that can be very expensive in uh, in the operation so that's my presentation if anybody has any questions i'd be more than happy to answer them all right bob thank you so much awesome presentation on Air bearing turbo blowers. Appreciate your time there. A um, couple housekeeping items before we jump into questions. Um, we are going to post a survey now, and then if you are open to sharing your contact information with today's presenter, uh, we will pass it along to them. And um, alternatively, we will be sharing our the presenter's contact information via email, and uh, he can share additional of. Uh, excuse me, share the presentation materials or potentially you can follow up with questions if there are questions after the presentation. So the survey should pop up now on your screen. Uh, just please let us know if you're open to sharing your contact information with the presenter. And if anyone would like, um, I'm always available for any kind of questions. Also, if something comes up later on, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Bob. And one other note on that, we also will have a recording of this presentation posted to the PNCWA website uh, where you signed up for this Lunch and Learn presentation. Uh, the presentation will be posted there, or the recording will, excuse me, within the next few days. So um, if you want to rewatch some of this or the whole thing, please um, use that as a reference also. All right, so we have some few minutes left here. So please, if you have questions for the presenter, post them um, in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll kick off a, a, an initial question here. Earlier in the presentation, Bobby mentioned the use of an inert, an inert gas as opposed to air um, for these blower applications. I was curious if you have seen that 
approach being used at water or wastewater facility, or if that's more of a, um, a unique or niche application of these blowers and these bearings. It was something that was used in municipal early on. I haven't seen it as much recently. Um, and you're right, sometimes on industrial wastewater, we, we see that a little bit more because they'll have inert gases for other applications. But, um, but I do see occasionally that spec out there and we, tr we tr are trying to get rid of that spec. What's typically, what other inert gases typically use for that application? Oh, uh, boy. Um, oh, what is it? Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on what kind of inert gas that, that the, they've been using. Um, oh. I, I guess uh, maybe a more appropriate follow-up question to that would be if that was a utility was to pursue a blower that had that um, that specified, they would there would be an additional incurred cost of purchasing compressed gas for that, or that's something that can be produced on site. Yeah, we we're we're um, suggesting not doing that because yeah. of, the, of the new designs. You don't need that anymore. Um, or that was something that was done some time ago, and it was and it was a kind of an outgrowth because. Um, of the filtering of the air bearing, there, there, or there, or I should say, the lack of filtering. So there was a lot of of air bearings that got fouled because of uh, moisture in the blower room or um, things like that. So in order to reduce that um, fouling of of that air bearing, that's where some people started introducing a closed system using an inert gas. Yeah. And now that's, with the new designs, uh, that's not necessary anymore. Sure. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, we had a, kind of a tangential point question here. Uh, somebody posted that their nephew played football for South Dakota State in Brookings for the past <laughs> four years, and they went to several games and the population from Wednesday and Saturday had zero in common. And uh, they appreciated the VFD analogy on that one. So yeah, um, it's uh, you're, you're resonating with the audience there. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to kind of the, the quantification of the savings for this technology over other blower styles, like a PD blower, um, whether that's in energy or whether that's in maintenance or um, just general efficiencies. Um, yeah. I think what, um, well, the, the controls that have come out for multi-stages have, have really closed the gap on that. Um, and I, th I think what really went up, when we, when we, if I were, were to make in a selection, you know, there's a, a bunch of questions I would, I would ask. And I think where the high speeds come in is they, they come in a nice package. Uh, everything's in in one package um, that you that you need. So um, you know it's it's you know that so there's instead of needing to go out and so you're sourcing a motor, you're sourcing a blower, you're sourcing controls and what controls are you going to put in there. It's all there and I'm, I'm sure all of us have been in that situation i know i have where i've been called in to um to troubleshoot something and i get there and i go well it's not my product why would you say that and they said well so and so was in here with the the valves or whatever and it says it's not his product so then now that's your loss because now you, like you say you've, if you've looked at maybe a stage and you you sourced from three or four different people and it's not one package now and everyone's pointing the finger at everyone else and you're left holding the bag well the high speed that's one thing that's nice about high speed you call you make one phone call and whoever it is will take ownership of that system um and efficiencies you know i'm always kind of leery a little bit about efficiencies um now there is a, a 
new requirements that's coming out um, that a lot of blower manufacturers where we're, they're more of a wire to air ratio. Um, and because no two blower manufacturers on efficiencies use the same criteria. So um, efficiencies are kind of, um, to me, not always the most accurate way to, to do it. But, I, but if I were to go in, I would look at the environment. I would look at, um, you know, because the other thing is with a, say with a multi-stage, you usually have to build a, a concrete base, which is an additional cost. You don't have, need to do that with a high speed. High speed, you've got um, four um, legs that stand on. It, you do want it balanced, it, I am, but you have those four legs to, to balance it. So some of the installation costs are less. So there's, um, so it's, I really think that's where you need to look at all those kinds of things and um, where, what system that would be best for your location. Sure. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, later towards the end of the presentation, you mentioned that um, as the bearing is coming up to speed, it'll achieve kind of stability in one to two seconds. And you mentioned that kind of you'd prefer that to be on the one second side. I was curious, is that feature a function of kind of operations and controls, like an external control of the blower? Or is the ability to get up to speed in um, one to two seconds and have that shaft stability more of a function of uh, a manufacturer specific blower design? It's, it's more of the manufacturer's design. Okay. Everyone's kind of doing it the same way in that, um, you know, there's, <laughs> I hate to. I like to say we're all, we're so much different than our competitor, but we're the technology of an air bearing has been around, like say for sixty years. And there's some little variations on them, um, but it's more of the manufacturers and how how they do how they do that um, and do they design it for that one to two seconds, you know, trying to get the stability in the four to seven seven second range where it's really beginning to be stable at around 2000 RPMs. And that, when it gets up to about 10,000, it's achieved that uh, stability. So it's a, it is a manufacturing uh, design that we've done. Um, we didn't, it, we used, at Hoffman Lansing, we did not have an air bearing. We had a mag bearing, but not a, an air bearing because of a lot of those issues. So we spent the last several years designing those kinds of things, seeing what the pitfalls were on the old air bearing and moving away from them. You know, things like um, pulling outside air, putting filters on the air bearing so you're not um, fouling, fouling the air bearing, you know, doing the cooling, um, larger machines having dual cooling systems, uh, those kinds of things. So that's, that's manufactured driven. Sure. All right, so we have about two minutes left here until the top of the hour. Um, if there's any additional questions, please post them in the chat box for Bob. And uh, just one other reminder that if you are calling in on the landline for the audio today, your name does not show up in our attendee list. So please contact myself or PNCWA management who sent out the link for today's presentation. Um, and we will follow up with the CEU information. Uh, kind of closing out with one question here. I know that maybe uh, folks are always curious about with blowers is, uh, you mentioned that they were sitting I think about the 60 to 70 decibel level, how does that compare to say like a positive displacement or other, um, other blower designs? Um, positive displacements probably in the mid seventies, uh, which is about the same for um, a multi-stage. And that's what's nice about, that's, I guess that would be the other thing that was, was nice coming to this package is you can get, um, noise attenuating um, cabinets for that to help reduce that, that, that sound sure. and the noise. Okay. Um, well, I think maybe we'll close it out with that. Again, we will share our, our presenter's information. Please reach out if you have questions. And then again, this presentation we posted to the PNCWA website. Bob, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we really appreciate the technical material you shared. All right, thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Appreciate it. All right, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks,